Black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the, the world. Thank you, Dan, for doing that. That's a great time for our children during the service to hear those stories and those lessons and to spend some time specifically with them. Thank you for that. We, uh, the sermon this morning is Three Friends in Prayer. Three friends in prayer. It's Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. And uh, this uh, is a continuation of last week. Last week, remember, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And uh, they had been hearing Jesus and watching him pray and observing him pray and hearing him pray. And, and they had come to the conclusion that the way that Jesus prayed and the way that John the Baptist prayed was much different than the way that the current people were praying, the priests were praying at that time. And so he gave them these bullet points, and I put little P words with all of these, but he said, make sure to say Papa, make sure to say Father. Start off by identifying the relationship that you have with the one that you were talking to. So our Father who art in heaven. And then he says, go on to the person. And hallowed would be your name, and we looked at that, meaning it's not just the name God, but it's everything about God is holy. And then to pray his plan, uh, thy will be done, thy, king, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in the heaven. And his will, his plan is for the gospel, the gospel to be heard, for them people to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we went on to provision, God's provision. Give us this day our daily bread and that, that we do recognize that our provision comes from him and that we need to uh, never assume, never assume that this, what we have is because of him and he's providing for us. And then pray for God's pardon, that uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, trespass against us. So we pray for uh, uh, daily for those times when we have done wrong and we ask for forgiveness. And while we're doing that, we are also forgiving others. And then the last P was God's protection. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we, we stay in his protection by staying in his word and staying with what he says. And so the, that was the prayer. And um, the, it's a big teaching that Jesus gives. And we learned last week that this isn't the first time he said this. Actually, he said it many, many times before. This is kind of an abbreviated one. But a big teaching from Jesus requires some supporting illustrations. And we've seen this in the past. That many times when Jesus gets done with a big teaching, he'll, he'll do a, an illustration, he'll do a story, he'll have a physical situation come up that's, that's directly related to just what he just said. And so that's what Jesus is going to do in this passage this morning. He's going to give a supporting illustration. And this is kind of Jesus' version of once upon a time, once upon a time. So the verse says, verse 5 says, he also said to them, so you get that sense. He just got done telling them how to pray. These are the bullet points of prayer. This is the framework of prayer. When you pray and you talk to God, make sure that these are part of your prayer. He says, as, as soon as he got done with that, he, he also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Now, I thought this is an illustration of Jesus, so I'm going to make it an illustration this morning. So I'm going to invite up a friend. So Jim Roy, I need you to help me. You're my friend. Come on up, Jim. Now, as Jim's coming forward, uh, when you read that verse, you might have had the song go through your mind. You have a friend, you know, James Taylor. Or you could have been of the one that you have a friend in me. Yeah, Toy Story, you know, it's a cover both ways. Right up here, Jim, just come, come on right up, you're my friend. Now, Jim is the first friend in the story, okay? Jim's the friend that's in bed. You can stand right up here, because it, it's, it's, it's like, oh, I know, I know. There you go. So Jim's the first friend who's in bed. Now, I'm the second friend outside. I'm the one that's come at midnight. I'm the one knocking on the door. I'm the one yelling into him, and he's in bed already. Now... They go to bed with the sun going down, so midnight is really midnight. 
okay? So he's went to bed around 7 o'clock maybe. And everybody's tucked into bed and all that. So he's been to bed for about five hours at this point. So this is going to be a big inconvenience at this point. So he's, he's, he's tucked in really nice. And then three lows. Now, the, the lows were not like we think lows or we think like big. And they're like flatbread. Yeah, they're like flatbread. And really what I am asking of him isn't exorbitant. It's not like, whoa, you know, no, three flatbreads would be a typical meal or depending on the size of the family that's there and everything so I'm coming at midnight waking him up out of a deep sleep and everything and I'm asking for really something that's kind of small I mean it's not really big it's really small at this point okay so we need some more information verse 6 because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him so now we got more in the story. Now you learn more about me and, and how prepared I am, kind of thing. But I need another friend. So Dan, come on up. You're my other friend. Here's my other friend. Yeah. <laughs> now, now that, that sometimes you really look bad at the guy in the middle here, but, but really, okay, the third friend is a friend of the second friend. We don't know if he's a friend of the first friend. We don't know that. But we know he's a friend of this second friend. And, and guess what? He woke me up. Yeah. I mean, I was already in bed. And he comes in the middle of the, he comes in the, middle of the night. He wakes me up. And not only does he wake me up, but he says, I'm hungry. I'm cold and I'm hungry. And not only does he do that, but then he points out how unprepared I am. He's so, I'm so unprepared that I don't have anything in the house to feed him. And so that prompts me to do what? To go to another friend. And uh, the second friend is unprepared for the next day. And what was the second friend doing all that day? I mean, really, you, you would be prepared for the next day. You would think about that next meal. You would have things ready to go for that next meal. But I didn't. What was I doing? How come? He's goofing off. You're unresponsible kind of thing. Now, but the second friend knows a good scout. The second friend knows a good friend. The second friend knows a friend who's always prepared, who would never even think of laying down on that mat until there's bread in the cupboard, or at least somebody to make it, right? Yeah, yeah. Got kids to feed. Got kids to feed, yeah. So, friend number two, unprepared, goes to friend number one, starts knocking on the door at midnight, he's in bed, saying, I need, I need a little bit of bread, I mean, just, just enough for a meal kind of thing, and admitting I'm unprepared, and, and this is the guy who started it all right here. I'd still be in bed <laughs> if it wasn't for Dan, okay, coming at when? Well, yeah, yeah, at midnight. <laughs> okay, now, story continues. Then he will answer. So this is this is first guy. The, he will answer from inside and say, "Do you want to say it? Go ahead and say it." Don't bother me. The door is already closed, and my children and I have gone to bed. Okay, now but say it with feeling. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> say it in the Greek. He says, "My children are with me in my bed." Oh, see, you're stealing my point. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So the first friend responds to the second friend, and basically is saying this. Do you want to know what time it is? <laughs> Don't you know what time it is? And uh, the door secured is a big deal. Okay, we think of a door, you know, uh, and click, and then we're done. There we go. Maybe a deadbolt. You know, and we, we're all set. We're all set for the next. That's not so in that day. To secure the door, I mean, there were boards that had to go in front of it, supports that would go up there, because the door was usually just an opened area. And so now to secure the door, to, to make it warm in the house and everything, that was a big deal. And once the door was all secured in the evening, you didn't take it back down. No, you didn't take it down until the morning. And so, so if you were going to go to the door, I mean, this, this is a major operation. You wouldn't just go click, click, click. You know, no, there'd be things to move, and then you'd have to move all that stuff back and everything. So this was a big deal. 
Another thing is the family is all sleeping, as Jim has already said, they're all sleeping in the same room. They don't have separate rooms. They're over here, over here, over here. No, they're all in the same room. They're on these mats that are there. So what it means is if Jim does get up, he is going to have to tippy-toe around all the kids that are on the floor and everything. And we all know, right, Jacqueline? Once you get the kids to bed, oh, yeah. Woo. Shh. Shh. You know, so, so they're all in the same room. And when you open the door, the house gets cold, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big opening. And, it's, and it gets cold. Now, uh, what does Karen think about this at this point in time right now? She just got woke up. She's grouchy. Oh, okay. There we go. So that's... And the three kids here are wondering if they're going to have bread tomorrow. Oh, you're going to give him what? Now listen, to, <laughs> now listen to what Jesus says. I tell you. So that, that's a really important phrase. Because Jesus is going to give you the outcome of the story. It's not you making up the outcome of the story. It's Jesus is telling you what the outcome of the story is. I tell you, even though he, he won't get up and give him, me, anything because he is his friend, yet because his friends, of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, it's not because I'm a friend. But it's because I keep knocking on the door and keep yelling, Jim, Jim, you know, kind of, that is like, oh, finally. So uh, let's go through these points. I tell you again, just that point again, that it, this is Jesus giving us the outcome of the story. The second thing is the first friend won't help the second friend because he is a friend. No, you're, you're really debating that now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the first friend will help the second friend because the second friend has shameless boldness. There's this persistency in this guy coming to the door, not stopping, not going to give up. I guess I got to do something. Now, what do you think this looked like? What do you think this looked like? What do you think this looked like? Did you, does it look like Jim going, oh, Karen's finally going, get up, get, you know, and, and so he gets up and he steps on Katie. Ah! You know, and she wakes up, and there's kids are screaming and, and everything, and he gets over to the cupboard, and he pulls it out, and then he, oh, he had to light a lamp, you know, to be able to see, and then he opens it up, and he gets the cut out, and then he gets over the door, and he's pulling things off, and, and then the cold air blows in, and all that kind of stuff, and, and then he just throws the bread at the guy. There, get out of here. Or do you think, or, or, was, be, was Jim laying in bed, and he heard the beautiful voice of his pastor. <laughs> and he goes, oh, the pastor has called. Wow. Who, who else gets the pastor to come at midnight? <laughs> and he is just overjoyed. And he, and he shakes Karen so gently and says to her, the pastor's here. <laughs> and he jumps out of bed. And he tiptoes over the children. And he's out of his excitement. He just tells the kids, the pastor's here. Oh, and we get to serve him. We get to serve him. And, and he's leaping over to the cupboard. And he gets the bread. And he, he takes down the door and everything else. And he says, oh, I couldn't think of anything outside what I wanted to do. No, that's probably not it. It's probably not it. It's probably the first one. Probably more the first one. That's the way that God would want us to see it. He really told the story so that we would feel that inconvenience of that happening to us. Now, I want you to thank the guys for helping me out as friends. <laughs> and we, we go on with the story here because he's not done. He's got a little more explanation to do. Nine and ten. And look at this again. He says, so I say to you, so again, this is, Jesus wants you to know the outcome of the story on his interpretation, how he is telling it. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now, um, Jesus says, I say to you, I say to you, I want to tell you what God is like. 
And then he does this progression. This ask, seek, and knock is a progression. And, um, and he actually says it twice. And when he says ask in our teacher mode here, what do you do? You raise your hand. If you've got a question, raise a hand. Raise a hand kind of thing. So that's ask. Raise a hand kind of thing. But then he ramps it up and he goes to the next one, seek. Now, how many remember, old, uh, welcome back, Cotter. How many remember, oh, a few hands, yeah, and Miss, welcome back, Cotter, Mr. Cotter had a student in his class named Horseshack, and, uh, and Horseshack, many times he didn't just raise his hand, Horseshack would raise his hand and go, ooh, 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 Mr. Cotter, Mr. Cotter, ooh, ooh, see, that's seek, that's a little more than just raising the hand, I mean, you've got to get attention, and then, then he goes up one more and he says, knock. And then sometimes Horshack would do this. He would raise his hand. He, would, he didn't get his attention. Ooh, 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 and that wasn't enough. He would get up on his chair. And he'd say, oh, my name is Cotter. So that's, he's, he's ramping it up. And this verb is in the imperative, present imperative, meaning Jesus is really saying, keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking. I mean, I'm instructing you to do this jim over here is like when is this gonna stop <laughs> you know kind of thing but god is so different god is saying no i want you to do it more i want you to keep on asking keep on seeking keep on knocking it's in, and it's so important jesus says it twice in verse 9 and then in verse 10 he just says it again uh, changes it up a little bit, but it's the same thing. He wants to make the point that this is what he wants them to do. Now, verses 11 and 12, a little more imagery he gives us. What father among you, because how did we start the prayer? Father, yeah. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? And if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Oh, what kind of father would do that? And so he gives these three, uh, three pictures here. Well, two pictures, but in another passage in another gospel, he gives a third one. I'm going to give you all three here. A snake instead of a fish. If you think about it, okay, if, if you didn't see what was there, a snake and a fish are, can be slimy, wiggly kind of thing. So it could be when you grab it, you could maybe, maybe kind of thing, but you wouldn't do that. You know, there's a huge difference between a snake and a fish in, in the outcome of a snake or a fish. And then he says a scorpion instead of an egg. And the scorpions uh, in, in that region were yellow and, and small, and they would curl up and they would look like an egg. So it, so it would look kind of like that. But, the, but there's a whole big difference between a scorpion and an egg in its outcome. And then the third one that's not in this passage, but he gives also is a stone instead of bread. And when you think of bread as a flat bread, yeah, you could find a piece of a stone that was flat that would kind of look in the same color as a bread, but man, it would be quite a difference if you bit into it, right? Um, but he says, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that, would you? No, not at all. You, you, won't, you don't deceive your family. And all of these things on the right-hand side here, I mean, are, are the, are for them, the basics of life. I mean, fish and eggs and bread. I mean, that, those, those were staples that they ate. And so those were really important to them each and every day. And you wouldn't take one of those very important things and substitute it with something that would hurt them. No, no, you wouldn't do that at all, would you? And, 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 and I am imagine, as he's telling his disciples and everybody else is wrong, they're just, no, no, you wouldn't do that. So then he goes into the next verse. If you then, now this verse is so important. If you then, who are evil. Now, he didn't say, if you then, who are being evil. He said, he's making an assessment here of everybody that is around him. And he said, if you then, who are evil. Remember, it's Jesus saying this. Jesus, God, is saying this. Know how to give good gifts to your children. See, if you're starting at that point that you are evil, that you are sinners in need of a Savior, and if you, even in that state, know how to give good gifts to your children, you can learn how to be good. You can learn how to have a moral code. You can learn how to do... And and actually, it's really good that we have good people in our world. In the sense of our, our, our world's definition of good, it is good that we have good 
people in our world doing good things. But when God looks at us, we all need a Savior. But if we can, as that starting point of being evil, can do good, then there's that phrase, how much more? So he wants us to contrast this. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, who are evil? Jesus gives us that as a fact. He's not, he's not leaving anybody out. He's not saying, well, everybody but. No, no, he's everybody. We are at that starting point, and even at that starting point, we can do good. How much more? He wants us to contrast in this story. He's saying, I'm not like this guy. Now, I'm going to do good, but I'm not like this guy and how this guy responds. I'm going to be different than this guy who is prepared, who has the bread to give out. And I want to tell you how I'm going to be different. And he says, and then... I just want to make that point again. How did he start out the prayer again? How much of your heavenly Father? Because he's, he's teaching the prayer, but he's also praying the prayer, and he's instructing us on how to pray. Our heavenly Father. And what do we get? The Holy Spirit. How much, we, how much more will he, your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit? I'm not asking for the Holy Spirit. I'm asking for a raise. You know, I'm asking for a new job. I'm asking for a girlfriend. I'm asking, well, not really. Um, just, these are illustrations. I, I'm, I'm asking for a cure. I'm asking for a miracle. I, I'm not asking for the Holy Spirit. I, I don't need the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus saying, no, when you pray, that's what God's going to bring to you, the Holy Spirit. Why? <laughs> because if you're praying a prayer where you need comfort, what is He What is the Holy Spirit? He's the comforter. If you're praying a prayer of needing counsel, what is He? The Holy Spirit is the counselor. If you're praying a prayer where you need help, what is the Holy Spirit? He's the helper. If you're praying a prayer where you need truth, what is the Holy Spirit? He's the truth reminder. If you're doing a prayer needing power, what is the Holy Spirit? He's the power giver. If you're doing a prayer where you need security, what is the Holy Spirit? He's the seal. If you have a prayer where you need guidance, what is the Holy Spirit? He is the guide. See, whatever your prayer is, we all need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to intervene in that time of prayer in His way so that we go the direction that God wants us to go. Many times it's not the direction we're going. Because we've got a preconceived motion idea in our head of how it's going to all turn out. And we've got it all planned out. But then God, if, if we actually call out to the whole God, he, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes us sometimes many in, times in a whole different direction. So the greatest thing that you could receive when you pray from your Father who loves you so much is to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the bread and the fish. And, and, and the fish and the egg. The fish, egg, and bread. That, the Holy Spirit is that. Uh, those, other, those other things are not. So, Jesus takes another run at this. And I want you to turn, it's not going to be up on the screen. I mean, the scripture passage is Luke 8, 10, 1 through 8. That's interesting. Seven, seven chapters later, Jesus says, I want to talk about this again, and I'm going to give you the same point, but I'm going to change the characters a little bit, just to to kind of change it up a little bit. So Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 8, says, now he told them a parable uh, on the need for them to pray always and not give up. See, that lets you know. He's talking about the same things. Keep on praying. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. He gives this parable about that specifically. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. So here's a judge who, who doesn't fear God. He says to God, ah, who needs him? He doesn't fear God at all. 
or anything that God has said, pff, eh, that's old school. And, and, and then he doesn't respect people either. So he's in a position where he's supposed to help out people, but he doesn't want anything to do with people. Okay? Does this sound like a great judge? No. That does sound like a terrible judge. Then verse 3, And a widow in that town kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. So now you have a widow. You have someone who's not, who has lost their husband, has no support, and, and who's in dire need because there's an adversary coming against her. So she is in need of justice. She's in need of protection. And where does she go? She goes to the judge because that's what the judge is supposed to do. And so she is calling out to him. Verse 4, for a while he was unwilling so for a while, when she kept coming to him saying, I need justice, I, I need protection, I need this, he just, ah, go somewhere else. Don't have time today. Hmm, look at the time. And, you know, and, and, and he just blows her off that many times. And then, but later, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people. And that's interesting. He knows where he's at. He knows that he has blown off God. He knows that he doesn't, he doesn't think anything of God. And he, he knows his own physical, spiritual state in that. He says, even though, I don't, uh, uh, even though I don't fear God, respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, because she keeps coming to my door and knocking, and she just will not let her up, and she just keeps on coming and coming and coming, um, he says, I will give her justice, something he wasn't doing. I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by this persistent coming. He says, I I'm not going to give her justice because I'm a judge. And that's like what I'm supposed to do in this situation. I'm going to give it to her because she just keeps pestering me. I got to get rid of her. See, friend number one, I I'm not going to get up and give him bread because he's my friend. And which I should do because he's my friend. But I'm going to give him bread because... He just keeps, he, he, I'm not going to get any sleep tonight if he keeps this up. So he goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, then the Lord says, listen to what the unjust judge says. He says, listen to what he says. I mean, listen to him, him saying that it's because of this persistence that he's going to act. Listen to that. And then he goes on to say, will not God grant justice to his elect or his family who cry out to him day and night. Now, he wants you to contrast, not say he is the unjust judge. No, to contrast, to say God is so different, in a sense, to the unjust judge because he's a just judge and he's going to respond differently to those who are crying out to him day and night. And then he goes on, will he delay helping them? And you shake your head, no. I tell you, that he will swiftly grant them justice. He will do exactly what he said he would do because he's God and he will fulfill those promises that he has that he's given to us. Now here's the, here's the ending and the end of the sermon too here. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, well, he's talking about him coming again because it's, it's the Son of Man who's actually saying this. <laughs> so, He's already there. But when he comes, meaning when he comes again, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on earth? Now, got to keep it in context to the passage of Scripture. What is he relating faith to? He's relating it to prayer. He's, he's saying one of the manifestations of a person who has faith in God is a person who prays is it continually comes before God in prayer, who comes before God at midnight if necessary in prayer, who calls out to Him in prayer. He's saying when the Son of Man comes back, is He going to find anybody in His family who is praying, who is showing their, their evidence of their faith that they are praying? And so as I've said before in the Gospel of Luke, He just brings this point up over and over and over and over again. That prayer is like so important. Uh, maybe this could be just a huge um, um, promo 
for when we do prayer again, uh, prayer week, uh, the last weekend in, or the last week in November. 6 a.m. in the morning, you go, wow, man, that's early. Well, if you go to bed at 6 o'clock at night, it wouldn't be so early. No, I'm just, I know that it works for some people, some, some people it doesn't. Um, maybe it's only a one-time deal, but would he find us praying? Would he find us seeking him out and calling out to him? Don't matter what, what time of the day it is. It doesn't matter what other people are thinking. You think of that first illustration and the second friend with the first friend. I mean, you know, she's, Karen's probably going, call 911, you know. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, you know. It doesn't matter in that situation. I need to get before God and I need to get before him on a regular basis and I need to call out to my God. Would he find us doing that when he returns? So I do really want to encourage you to be in prayer. And I do want to encourage you, if that works out for you, that prayer time that we have, um, uh, that we're going to have to, to come into this sanctuary and spend some time just pouring your heart out to God. But I don't want to just hold you to that because maybe the, today is the day to pray. Maybe today is the day that you have a burden on your heart that's so heavy and you need to realize, I need to call out to God. And he is different than the first friend. And he is very different than the unjust judge. And, and, and he's, he's going to give me something. And what I'm going to get is the Holy Spirit to guide me, to comfort me, to counsel me. Whatever I need, the Holy Spirit is going to guide me through that. So maybe today's the day for prayer. So Ben and team, come on up. We're going to have a final song here. The song is, Lord, I need you. And... Uh...